Hello, <clears throat> my name is Ross Marshall, and I'm um, discussing universal reconciliation, or the restitution of all, according to the Bible, contrary to orthodox teachings. And we're discussing the will of God. What is the will of God? What does he want to do on earth as he has willed in heaven? Well, what he wants to will on earth, and he is willing on earth, is the salvation of all mankind. He wills that all men be saved. We're picking up with 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 6. God will save all. Now hear what uh, this verse has to say. I exhort therefore, first of all, petitions, prayers, supplications, and giving thanks, and the giving thanks to be made for all human beings, anthropos, for kings, and for all that are in eminence. For example... Well, very ones we wouldn't want to pray for, uh, but there they are. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all piety and respect. Good and acceptable is that in the sight of God our Savior who wills, hello, that all mankind be saved. Uh, a lot of people quote and they don't finish the whole thing. And what else? And to come into the full knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, Anthropos, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom on behalf of all to be testified in its own times. If we look at this in Greek and get the correct translation, it's exactly what it says who gave himself a ransom on behalf of all, to be testified in its own times. Paul exhorted believers to pray for all humanity so that leaders will provide a stable environment in which believers may conduct peaceful lives in devotion to God. Another moat for universal prayer is God's sovereign will to save all mankind. Verse 3, Peter communicated that same point in Second Peter 3, 9, where he says, God is not willing, hello, fellow, that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God controls all, or works all, draws all in Christ to his good, that he may be all in all. God is shown here rather willing, fellow, philo, all to be saved and not to be damned. See also 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Well, thank you, George Howe. Next, we discuss and look at verse Acts 3, 28-21. The restoration of all. <clears throat> Quote, And he should dispatch the one fixed upon before you before for you, Christ Jesus, whom heaven must indeed receive until the times of restitution of all, which God speaks through the mouth of his holy prophets, who are from the eon. And I said before, since the world began, but the, uh, the, uh, in, uh, the incorrect translations, uh, uh, word for world is uh, cosmon system. But it, it, the Greek says eon, it, it, it meaning age. It's the mouth of these holy prophets who are from the eon. Well, the first eon that started, uh, the Adamic one, of, of needing a prophecy uh, to uh, uh, console the heart of fallen Adam. So that's when the prophecy started. The times of restoration were described by David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, and other Bible prophets. The passage means that the heavens must receive the Lord Jesus Christ until all that was spoken by the prophets in relation to his work, his reign, the spread of the gospel, the triumph of religion, shall have been fulfilled. It also conveys the idea of the predicted recovery of the world from sin, the recovery of every man from sin, and the restoration of peace and order, the consummation of the work of the Messiah. The prophets prepared the way for Christ and dwelt on 
reconciliation in their writings. The writer of this verse is refreshing the memories of his hearers of the promise given to Abraham that restoration covers all and that the whole of humanity are included too, not just things. The Lord spoke of restoration in Revelation 21.5 saying, Behold, I am making all new. Restoration of all is like a building for which God the Father was the architect. Jesus Christ was the contractor and the prophets and apostles were its promoters spreading the good news. Thank you, George. The word things is not in the Greek. It's in brackets. It's been added. Just all. It just means all. <clears throat> to this interpretation, no one can object. It is undoubtedly correct, for it is liberal, giving to the passage all the latitude of meaning that the universalist could desire. The idea of the predicted recovery of the world from sin and the restoration of peace and order. What is this but universalism? Biblical universalism. Yet we are told by tradition that it is limited in scope, and it does not mean that all men shall be saved, or that the evils of sin, sin can be repaired or remedied. remedied. A corrected. This can never be, for the mischief is done and will never be undone. Sometimes something is rather strange with this traditional idea. We will not call it an inconsistency, but an, only an oversight. In the first place, we are informed that the passage conveys the idea of the predicted recovery of the world from sin and the restoration of peace and order. By who predicted? The verse answers, by the mouth of all the God's holy prophets since the age began, the ages. Were these true prophets or were they false? True ones, unquestionably, because they are styled, quote, God's prophets. Did they predict the recovery of the world from sin and the restoration of peace and order? Certainly, the prediction will be fulfilled. Is there not an oversight here? Just such a one as the physician would commit, who should tell his patient that he would recover from his sickness, though he would always remain sick, though the patient will be restored to health, yet he will not get well. This can never be, for the mischief is done and cannot be undone. Hmm. Well, it's tradition. Salvation to all the people. Luke 2, 29-32. Now, you are dismissing the slave of you, O owner, according to the declaration of you in peace. For my eyes perceive the salvation of, from you, which you make ready, suiting the face of all the peoples. A. Light into for the revelation of nations and glory of you, the people Israel. Concordant literal. The AV I'm more familiar with uh, <clears throat> says, Lord, now let thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to the a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. In 1 Timothy 2, 1-6, it says, I'm entreating first, then, first of all, excuse me, I, I'm entreating then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, pleadings, and thanksgivings be made for the sake of all humans, for the sake of all kings, and all the ones being in superiority, that we may be leading that mild and quiet livelihood in every all devoutness and gravity. For this is ideal and welcome in the sight of the Savior of us, God, who is willing all humans to be saved and to be becoming into realization of this truth. For there is one God and one mediator of God and man, the man Christ anointed Jesus, the one giving himself as a corresponding ransom for the sake of all, the witness in its own ages. A.V. says, Be made for all men, all the human race, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we mankind may, 
etc., who is willing all mankind to be saved, who gave himself a ransom sacrifice for all to be testified in due time. Uh, in the Greek, the chron uh, word chronos is not there, like the King James says. It's uh, the own errors. Era. Age. What is ideal and welcome, or good and acceptable, in the sight of God for men to have peaceful, honest, and righteous lives, and to reaffirm their salvation is our supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks towards all humans, all kings, and all superiors. We are commanded to pray for all men in 1 Timothy 2.1, to pray for our enemies, even for those who despitefully use us and persecute us in Matthew 5.4, to pray in faith, for we are told that whatsoever is not of faith is sin, Romans 14.23, to lift up holy hands and pray without wrath and doubting, 1 Timothy 2.8. In our prayers we should be in willing agreement with God that all men be saved just as God is willing all humans to be saved eventually and to know the truth. <clears throat> it is stated very clearly that there is one God and that Jesus is the mediator that gave himself as a ransom for all human beings for he stands vicariously between all humans and God, his Father. Thus the thanksgiving, thanksgivings we are making for all humans all kings and all those in superior stations, as well as the lowest ones, too, is because they are all ultimately to become universally reconciled in Christ. As God is love, quote, it must be his will that every human be saved. An infinitely good being could have no other will and as he is infinite in knowledge, he could not so will unless he knew all would be saved. He could not will that that should take place, which he never knew never would. It's by Mr. Manford, Reverend Manford. It's a quote. <clears throat> a bit of an old style of writing, tongue twisting. <laughs> How could there be any thanksgivings made relevant to all humans if all humans are not ultimately reconciled? How can we pray in faith for the salvation of all men unless we believe that all will be saved? Why pray for all men if God has determined that not all shall be saved? Or sees that man chooses, most of them don't choose to be saved. Contingencies. How could anyone give thanks in light of the eternal damnation of a single soul? The above passage says all, and as it w has been willed to be so, all men will come eventually into this realization of the truth as the ransom encompasses all of humanity in due time or by the end of the eons. Surely this will happen before the conclusion of the eons. The fact that we are required to pray for all men without the false idea of only a few being saved, but rather that all men are will to be saved, and to do so in faith, nothing doubting, is a strong proof of the great hope and doctrine of universal reconciliation. Christ prayed for the whole world to know him, quote, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, that the world may know that thou hast sent me. John seventeen twenty to 23 Jesus then prayed that the world, all mankind, not the planet earth, shall believe on him and may, no, and may know him. Now, he must have prayed in faith for the apostle Paul himself said, that which is not of faith is sin. Romans 14.23 Would Jesus have prayed thusly if he had known that the majority of mankind were beyond the reach of mercy and that God has ordained unborn millions to hopeless despair? Why pray for all if God's mercy is predetermined only to a part? Could Jesus have prayed in faith for all to be saved if he had known his Father's will was to damn the vast multitudes and that multitudes yet to be born would be? Impossible. Hmm. 
we are to pray for the damned, even. First oh. Timothy two one. We're commanded to pray for all. I exhort, therefore, that supplication, prayers, etc., 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 be made for all men. First Timothy two one. It uh, doesn't seem like it clarifies whether a man are breathing or not. God would not require us to pray for all if it were not his purpose that salvation should be universally employed and enjoyed. Although limitarians contend for this absurdity that the all-wise God command his creatures to ask him to grant what is not, never was, and never will be, his intention to bestow. Oh, how inconsistent is this traditional error. None can obey the divine commandment, which is to pray for all men in faith, unless they believe in universal salvation. The Calvinists can pray in faith for the elect only, because they cannot pray for the damned. Arminians can pray in faith, but can only expect a few to choose. Thus, they also cannot pray for those who God will damn. But the biblical universalists can pray for the entire human race, both living and the dead and the damned, and that, too, in full faith, without wrath or doubting, and expect all to be reconciled. They are the only class of Christians who do obey both these divine injunctions and whose faith corresponds with their prayers. Let this be remembered. God's will, none to perish, but all to repent. God wills none to perish, but all to repent. Second Peter 3, 9. <clears throat> God is not willing, fellow, that any should perish, like some theologies teach, but that all should come to repentance. See 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 6. Another way of saying this would be, quote, God is willing not that anyone is to be perishing, but he is willing that all will come to repentance. Or, quote, God is willing all should repent, and should not perish. No matter how you say it, or even twist it, you cannot say he is willing, or causing, or even going to allow any to perish. In the case of ultimate reconciliation, there is no such false thing as God's permissive will that should allow any to perish without his intervention. Thank you, George. John 16.13 says, How be it, when the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you mankind, brackets, into all truth, KJV. This makes even more sense after reading, quote, God works all things human and etc. to the good, because God wills all men to be drawn towards salvation. Also, Christ draws or drags all men unto himself. Remember that verse, all God and His will do not change. Math Malachi 3.6 and James 1.17 God is unchangeable. I am the Lord, I change not. James 1.17 God does not vary. Quote, With whom God is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. If God is unchangeable, he will endlessly remain what he has been in all time past and is now, and he is all he and he and as he always has and does now seek the good of his creatures, therefore he always will. Thus, as he loves all, he wills all, and therefore in willing not that any should perish, he shall save all. Luke six thirty six God wants us merciful. Kind of hard to find nowadays, but anyway, quote, Be thus, man, therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. I sometimes question traditional orthodoxy. Is it really merciful? Well, only to a special class of people. Well, however they may be getting there. How many times does God have to say, His mercy endureth for all ages? Psalms 136. Read that. Count them. See if you can count how many. For all mankind until you can believe his word. 
Is the Father merciful in that he allows the majority to perish, if not willing them to perish? God's mercy is not some empty attitude of stand by and watch the multitudes perish, but one of willing all to repent and be saved. In Joshua 23:14, we have uh, something. God keeps every promise. He's a promise keeper. Thank you, George. Every last word of God to Israel is secure, and so are his words throughout all Scripture to all people. Every divine oath will be authenticated. We can be very sure that every phrase spoken by Christ in John 12:32 will fully transpire, and that Romans 16:25 will surely come to pass. Quote, now to him who is able to establish you in accord with my evangel and the heralding of Christ Jesus in accord with the revelation of a secret hushed in times ages past. interesting. Go read those two verses and we will uh, be finishing up here and finalizing the will of God. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with his gospel and the heralding of Jesus Christ to people in accord with the revelation it's of a secret it was hushed in times past but no secret now. Of course, orthodoxy likes to make it a mystery and a hush-hush to those who either cannot hear or don't want to, and they put a seal of eternity on it. It's ridiculous. Okay, we'll be moving on to uh, part five. Thank you.